we have um, Chris Kane from the Post Landfill Action Network, and uh, the uh, the abbreviation is PLAN, which is uh, which is really impressive. Uh, that's something that I was found impressive. So um, well done with the naming and. Uh, <laughs> And um, so, uh, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing? You know, what Plan does, and uh, what kind of traction you're getting, and also about you know what you're going to do today. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Great. So, um, as Ranjit said, my name is Chris Kane, and I'm the uh, director of research and resource development with the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, what we are is a national nonprofit that works with students and staff members at campuses, uh, particularly colleges and university campuses all over the country, to um, help them start and sustain waste reduction projects uh, with the ultimate goal to get those campuses to be zero waste. And along with teaching those um, kind of specific projects and how to implement those on their campuses and within their communities, uh, which some of those projects I'll talk about today. We also teach students on kind of like general skills building for planning any project, whether they are in the field of sustainability or other fields. Volunteer um, management, marketing of different ideas, um, leadership skills and leadership turnover, um, and fundraising. So a little bit of both in that uh, we do a lot of organizing skills as well as uh, specific zero waste program advising. We currently work with 80 campuses across the country, uh, helping them to move towards zero waste. Right, and um, uh, so I think this is something that uh, that's been really impressive about, uh, about you, which is not just focusing on the technical knowledge, but also you've been, you know, trying to um, uh, provide access to communication skills, uh, access to learn communication skills, and organizing skills, which I believe are extremely important uh, to be able to, you know, handle any new change or any new movement to create change. So that's amazing. And um, I, I'd like to thank Diana Cohen from Plastic Pollution Coalition for, you know, directing me towards you and, you know, getting me in touch with you. So um, thanks for that, Diana, if you're watching. Um, and um, so, uh, Chris, um, are you ready to um, begin your um, presentation about the Plastic Free Campuses? Huh? Yeah, I'm ready to dive in, and shall I just um, kind of give you a note when it's time to go to the next slide? Um, sure, yeah, yeah, just just do that, and I'll be able to um, change to the next slide. But uh, let me just add uh, one more comment before we start. So, um, friends, so um, uh, the, the challenges that we face, like climate change or plastic pollution, are really planetary, and the, the scale is really large, but the solutions are all local. Um, most solutions are local. So um, for us to be able to address uh, issues like this, uh, it's not enough if one person or one organization does something about it, but it's all of us, you know, taking uh, whatever, doing whatever we can do in whatever situation we are. Um, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, leadership doesn't mean uh, you have to have a leadership position, but you can be anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community, and you can still take, um, you know, a step ahead and then uh, bring about change. So, which is why we are, uh, we thought it was really important to um, go through this manual, which talks about how different many campuses, many university campuses, can go plastic-free as a first step towards, you know, environmental, um, environmental sustainability. So, um, with that, um, I, um, you know, I welcome Chris to, you know, talk about the presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Ranji. And I think that's a really powerful point um, before I dive into my presentation is. The reason that we do work with campuses as we see them as sort of microcosms of society that can really mimic change in society at a larger scale. And so when you take a program that is maybe establishing reusable items in cafes or banning single-use plastic bottles, bags, microbeads, which I'll talk about today, um, on a campus and you can kind of observe in a semi-controlled environment how that exists and what the challenges are, what the successes are, what the education outreach needs are, and what the logistics are, you can um, replicate that on a larger level with, with society. So um, it's a really powerful point that uh, smaller solutions, uh, whether you are a student leader or whether you are kind of more of a quote unquote follower, but you are you know, a very committed volunteer, you can just pop in to a project every now and then 
every sort of effort is needed. And so that's what we really focus on in, in our advising. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. But the main content that I want to dive into is how to establish a plastic-free campus. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. So what does plastic-free mean? Um, sometimes that might be a term that's kind of thrown around in a remoshed way, but how we define plastic-free is reducing or eliminating the use of single-use disposable plastics. So plastic is a very valuable material in our society and has done a lot of good, especially in the medical field and um, in areas where maybe uh, drinkable water is not as easily accessible or with natural disasters, such as we've seen recently with the um, hurricanes and um, Hurricane Harvey and recently at Hurricane Irma. Um, but the daily use of single-use disposable plastics isn't really necessary, and it's an item that takes a while to break down, um, if it will break down at all. Uh, it, once it does break down, it will uh, become particulates and to waterways, um, can feed into ocean marine life and ultimately feed up the food chain, causing um, hormonal imbalances and other health effects of ecosystems and people. So when we say plastic-free, single-use disposable plastics, we mean things like straws, water bottles, um, cutlery that you get for your to-go food, a uh, to-go container, and kind of the dreaded plastic bags. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, there's a huge movement around eliminating and reducing single-use plastics. One from uh, one of Diana Cohen, who Renji mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is from the Plastic Pollution Coalition. They are one of many organizations throughout the world who are working to fight um, pollution of plastic in oceans, as well as in our more terrestrial environments. Um, both from the end of the line of, you know, how do you clean up oceans that are filled with microplastics, to the beginning of the line of uh, how do you um, kind of resist the ramping up of plastic production on uh, a more consumer level? Um, how do you take away the power of large plastic industry to be able to continually produce and profit off of um, a material that is extremely toxic. And so a couple of ways that you can kind of track the movement are um, through the Surfrider Foundation, Plastic Pollution Coalition, the Five Gyres Institute, um, PlasticBagBanReport.com goes into a lot of areas throughout the country where single-use plastics are banned in municipalities. And then I kind of listed some hashtags here that you can look up as well. You can go to the next slide. So when you're working towards reducing or eliminating single-use plastics, where do you start? Um, usually we like to start with assessing what exists on campus. So I'll go a little bit first into a plastic audit and how to conduct that and what that entails. And then I'll also be going into various kinds of solutions from the individual level uh, to things like, you know, bringing your own bag or um, up to the systemic level of changing infrastructure of somewhere like a college campus to no longer offer, offer single-use single disposable plastics. Good, thank you. And so first we're just gonna dive into the first steps. Next slide. So uh, plastic audits can be conducted in multiple ways. Um, one is conducting a visual assessment, which is purely just kind of observing the population of a campus or um, goers to a cafe or eatery establishment and noticing the plastics that they are using, whether those be you know, single-use forks, knives, and sporks, um, water bottles, solo cups, coffee cups, things like that. You can also take a procurement inventory, um, and that involves kind of going to cafes and eateries and talking with uh, dining heads and um, managers or procurement offices on a campus, which is usually the office that is in charge of all purchasing for the campus to discuss what types of single-use plastics they are ordering. So what number and how often do they order um, coffee cup lids and things like that. Um, and then there are different ways to track this, which we'll kind of go into those systems next. You can go to the next slide. So when you are conducting your plastic audit, you really want to keep these questions in mind because they will inform um, what alter alternatives will be best to replace the items that you're trying to reduce or eliminate from campus. 
and that is what plastics are being used on campus and where do they come from? Which of these items are most frequently used? Where are single-use plastics disposed of? So it's not only tackling the beginning of the line of when they're consumed, but when they're disposed of, how can you make sure they're disposed of properly? And who is the single-use disposable plastics on campus being used by? Next slide. And so this is an example of um, a visual assessment of a plastic audit. Um, you see we've got our various lists of plastics um, listed on the left-hand side there. And usually this can be um, maybe taking like an hour or two in a coffee shop sporadically throughout the week to get um, a representative and random sample to see what kind of items are people using. Um, where do you think they are sourced from on campus? Like for example, if there is, um, let's say a Panda Express or a Chick-fil-A or Starbucks on the campus, you'll easily recognize the, the item from the, that logo and be able to record that. Um, or if there are items being brought out from, from off of campus, um, how can you tackle those items? Here's the next slide. And uh, this is a procurement inventory. Um, so this is usually talking to a dining manager, the manager of a cafe, or someone within the purchasing office at your campus. And this is to figure out what types of material they are purchasing, purchasing the number that is um, and volume that is purchased each year, and the cost of those items per order. This is really important because if you were to suggest an alternative like a compostable to-go container or reusable to-go containers, or um, offering a discount on people bringing their own mug, then it will be very important to be able to speak to the cost differences um, that's going to be one of the main, one of the main um, concerns of a dining manager or procurement officer. The next slide, please. Great. And so just to go into a little bit more into procurement inventory, um, it's really important to establish a relationship with dining staff. Uh, usually they are very strapped for time, so if any of your students, uh, it's really good to kind of like establish rapport uh, with these individuals on campus and really kind of like listen to their concerns, be willing to negotiate on the project that you want to propose, whether that be phasing out, you know, to go plastic boxes on the campus or phasing out straws and really kind of understand where their, where their um, concerns are at. Um, it's also important to know if you have a purchasing office on campus, whether or not you should be talking to them or the dining services. And it really just kind of takes starting that conversation um, to find out which would be best. Another important thing to take into account is does your campus buy from directly from a company that produces things like um, coffee mugs or uh, disposable cutlery, or do they buy from a distributor uh, with campuses and also large business businesses, they will usually purchase um, supplies from a large distributor that uh, the distributor themselves is sort of like the, the middle person uh, that procures from the companies and is able to sell uh, products from various companies at a discount and bulk to their buyers. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, knowing the cost comparison for cost savings or potential, um, potential higher costs. Next slide. So I wanna go into a few examples that touch on both individual action and uh, systemic change. And so the first one is uh, a school at the uh, University of Hawaii in Manoa. And they worked a couple of years ago to ban styrofoam containers. Um, a very passionate student who has worked with us for several years now uh, was kind of spearheading this effort. And um, she eventually was able to pass a petition along with sort of a sustainability task group on campus to phase out and um, collectively ban uh, styrofoam containers from being used in dining areas on campus, um, as well as any cafes that were contracting with the campus. Um, some of the major roadblocks that they came into were um, the cost of compostable items versus styrofoam items. So the hope was to replace these styrofoam to-go containers with um, compostable bioware type containers that were made of like plant material because the university did have the capacity to compost those items. And that's a really important thing to take into consideration is that if you are looking for an alternative to single use plastics on your campus, you need to make sure that the alternative is like a compostable bioware to go container is um, disposed of correctly and the, the systems that your campus has for managing waste. So if there's compost available and that compost stream can handle um, 
uh, biowares that are produced from, from plant materials, then that's really important to take into consideration. Another major roadblock was figuring out what the transition period would be for campuses who, or excuse me, uh, dining areas on campus that had maybe had a lot of styrofoam containers in stock. And obviously they don't wanna just throw those away. They'd like to have them used because they've been purchased um, and how to kind of figure out how to use that stock and transition into the alternative, which for you, Hawaii Manoa was um, compostable to go containers. Some solutions that they came up to those were, um, they were really fortunate to have a representative from the Bioware company, World Centric, uh, who was, uh, uh, I believe a staff member on the campus and was able to sit in on the sustainability task force. So that individual was able to speak of all of the cost savings and cost benefits of the campus purchasing compostable to-go containers in bulk, as opposed to styrofoam to-go containers. Um, to give a little insight, World Centric is um, a for-profit company that produces different biowares, compostable cups, um, uh, cutlery, chopsticks, um, to-go containers, things like that, that are made from the, um, the byproduct of wheatgrass. So they are producing the materials from something that would otherwise be wasted and uh, using that waste to, to create a new product. They used to be a, a nonprofit group and uh, switched to for-profit so that they could continue uh, to allocate funds so that they can uh, channel those funds into composting systems and businesses and at universities. So the group was very fortunate to have a representative to speak to those cost benefits. And then as far as transitioning the campus out of uh, the existing styrofoam containers, they allowed a grace period for uh, cafes who maybe had a large stock and needed to get rid of those items. And um, really what it came down to was any new contract coming on campus had to, um, within their contract, ensure that they would not be using styrofoam containers. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to put this up because this is some language specifically from the proposal that they submitted to the campus to ban containers. And so um, something that's really notable in here is that uh, this applies to new or renewed food service contracts. So any new food services coming on campus or um, any food services that are currently existing once their contract is renewed, which is three to five years usually for like a cafe vendor on campus, then they would have to face a styrofoam. And then you can see here also that um, vendors operating under these contracts uh, were um, advised to kind of like um, the grace period of using up the items that they have before switching over to compost tools. Next slide, please. So potential partnerships for if um, like your campus um, or you are interested in doing this in your business place, something like that, are um, on the right there. That is an example of a world-centric compostable to-go container. And um, often you can, if you're looking to kind of establish this large scale, you can negotiate um, a discount with World Centric on that. Um, and then on the left there, those are Preserve product containers. Preserve is um, a US-based company who um, has all US-based products that are made from recyclable materials and they themselves are uh, number five plastics and so can be recycled at the end of their life. So that's another example of um, a reusable to-go container that um, can be reused time and time again. Next slide, please. So uh, next example uh, that we're gonna speak to about roadblock solutions and potential partnerships are uh, banning single-use water bottles on campus. This was done by the University of Vermont back in 2013. Uh, while it, was, it came from an effort four years in the making from students trying to petition to ban water bottles on campus, um, what as it was banned, uh, students initially thought this would be a huge success, but actually find that once water bottles were banned on campus, students uh, decided to be procuring sugary drinks more. And so it wasn't that any less single use um, plastic bottled beverages were being uh, purchased by students. It was just that the items that were being purchased uh, tended to have a more negative health effect on the student population. Um, so some of the solutions that uh, came with this, and this, this is a really important uh, case study because it's often assumed that, well, if we ban plastic water bottles, then we will ban the, the issue of, of plastic bottles on campus. But there needs to be um, alternatives in place so that students can uh, get their drinks from um, other sources. And so some of the solutions that University of Vermont 
um, employed were filling stations on campus. So that involved kind of retrofitting existing water fountains on campus with uh, long neck type spouts, or kind of um, some of you all may have seen like a water bottle filling sensor um, so that reusable water bottles could be filled up on campus easily. Um, also, they wrote into their contracts for bottle beverage purchasing that half of bottled drinks on campus had to have certain health standards. Um, so they reduced the amount of sugary drinks on campus. Campus also did not offer sodas or bottled beverages that could be found in like um, a soda fountain type of format. Um, and then also they launched a drink local water campaign. So really focusing on tap water and the value of that. Uh, next slide, please. And so some potential, um, oh, it looks like the picture on the right there got a little fuzzy, but uh, some potential partnerships for if your campus would like to do this is really uh, working to see if there are companies that you can procure reusable water bottles for to provide students with, whether that be an orientation or um, something that they can purchase at the bookstore, something like that. And on the left here, you've got Liberty Bottles, which is, again, a US-based company. And then on the right, um, it's supposed to be a picture of a clean canteen bottle that is co-branded. So this is a really good opportunity for uh, student groups on campus that if your campus is switching to reusable bottles, then um, student groups, whether that be like an environmental club or um, uh, an athletics team on campus, can co-brand and have their logo on those items um, to kind of support the, the image of the school. Um, another important partnership in these types of projects are uh, community partnerships. And so um, there are some campuses that locally uh, within the municipality, things like bags or bottles have been banned. And so to kind of piggyback on that effort can be uh, sort of a catalyst to banning those items on campus and make it more accessible and, and less confusing so that when a, a student goes from their campus environment to the local community environment, uh, it's consistent as far as the types of materials that are used and how waste is disposed of. Next slide, please. So my final example is uh, reusable to-go containers on campus. And so this is the system that is really in place for when something like styrofoam containers are banned from a campus. And maybe your campus doesn't compost, and so you don't have the capacity to have compostable to-go containers on campus. It's also a great opportunity because it's always within um, the perception of the uh, waste reduction hierarchy. It's always best to reuse before recycling and composting. And so reusable to-go containers and reusable anything is really the best option. Um, a reusable to-go to container program is essentially um, within a system, uh, within a campus or a business or municipality, uh, cafes and eating areas will have uh, like a plastic container, sort of like the green one that I showed on the screen earlier. And uh, these are kind of uh, circulated through a system in that when a student goes to pick up their meal at a cafe, they can have the meal served in this uh, reasonable to-go container. Um, and then once they are done with that container, they can drop it off at a drop-off location on campus or can bring it back to the next cafe that they go to and have it washed and cleaned behind the counter. Uh, usually students are opting into this as maybe like a small fee that is a part of their tuition that they're automatically opted into, or um, they can choose to opt into this. So they might pay $15 for the container for the entire year and then use that throughout the year. And then um, once they return uh, their container at the end of the year, they can get that as a refund. So um, it's a really interesting model that um, if folks want to get my contact info and learn more about it, after the presentation, I'd be happy to share. Uh, so some roadblocks to this, um, if you go back to the previous slide, some roadblocks to this include um, just upfront costs of buying reusable containers and not for each student on campus and for them to be in circulation for when there are some that are dirty, you wanna have enough that are clean. Um, also containers can sometimes get lost, stolen from students or even broken. Um, and then what do you do when you have a visitor to campus who isn't necessarily opted into this program? Um, but you want to be eliminating single-use containers from campus. Uh, some of those solutions were, as I mentioned earlier, to have an automatic charge on student accounts so that when someone becomes a student of a campus, they are automatically opted into this program. 
that um, on their student ID, you know, they swipe when they go into the cafe and uh, they are automatically able to receive a reusable to go container and that they can get refunded for that at the end of the year once they return the container. Um, charging for lost containers is a great way to, for the program to just kind of sustain itself financially. Um, and then eliminating the disposable counterparts. So uh, in order for the reusable to go container program to be a success, there really has to be um, there has to be an incentive or maybe a little wiggle room to not use that program. And so some campuses have been able to phase out um, the majority of their disposable containers so that uh, using a disposable container when you go to eat out or order a drink somewhere is a last resort. And then um, uh, another solution to having like visitors on campus is for um, those visitors to maybe put uh, down like a $15 refundable charge to use a, a reusable to-go container in their time at the campus. And then they have a 48 hour uh, period to return that at a drop-off location or at a participating dining location. And uh, then they will receive the deposit back on their, on their account. Let me go to the next slide. And so some really important potential partnerships for this are, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Preserve product containers. They um, produce a lot of containers that are really useful for this system. Uh, some campuses use a manual take back system in which when a student is done with their container or it's dirty and they need to get a wash, they'll give it to a dining staff member at the front who like lets them in. Um, or you can have these uh, sort of like passive return stations through our campus on the right here. Uh, OZ is one company that um, creates these passive stations and it's essentially, you know, the container is inserted back into the, into the collection system um, and these stations can be serviced by staff members. So that's, that's a little bit more convenient because maybe you've got a student who's studying for finals and it's 2 a.m. and then you drop off their container, they can do this rather than waiting till the dining area opens. Uh, next slide, please. And so with all these solutions, uh, before we go into some time for Q&A, um, I really want to touch on a couple main points and that uh, partnerships are really important for any sort of successful program, whether it be um, banning single-use plastics or reducing them. And that's important because you want to have alternatives to those disposable plastics. And it can also be really useful to align the values of the campus or the goals of the campus with the surrounding community that the campus is set in. And so maybe if you have, um, if your campus has particular ties with the local government or um, city government in which your campus lives, then to be able to discuss like, hey, is there an opportunity for a program like this to exist outside the campus as well? Um, positive and negative reinforcement um, is really important uh, to uh, negotiate the difference between the two. So uh, a lot of times, uh, programs like bring your own reusable mug or bring your own reusable to container, things like that, will um, provide a discount on drinks for that item. Uh, and a lot of our research, we've actually found that to be less effective than if you actually have a negative reinforcement in place. So that being that um, reusable is the only option, and if you have to use a disposable, then you are charged extra. So it's just a really interesting finding that we find. Um, and then with any of these programs, it's always constant communication, education, outreach. You can have the best signage through our campus, you can have the best communication as far as social media about these programs that exist, um, but there's always going to be someone who overlooks that. And so it's constant communication and not giving up on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I apologize for the busyness of this slide. It was supposed to have some animations, but um, basically this was to um, emulate the resources that we have as a network, whether you are a student or a staff member on campus and are looking to reduce waste on your campus, we advise on not just plastic free initiatives, but also um, establishing reuse spaces like uh, campus uh, thrift stores or free stores, um, starting expanded recycling projects for things like hard to recycle items like styrofoam or electronics, um, conducting waste audits to assess like what is the situation on your campus and then what materials need to be targeted that can be reduced. Um, to go container programs and um, also food recovery, gleaning food and composting on, on campus. And so um, I would love to get in touch. Um, I don't have my contact info on here, but it is Chris, C-H-R-I-S at post landfill, P-O-S-T-L-A-N-D-F-I-L-L dot org. 
Um, and Ranjit, I'm sure that that uh, that information will be will be available as well after this presentation. Um, and then you can go to the next slide as well. Um, but uh, kind of shameless plug is that we are having a conference in November in Philadelphia at Temple University, where for the entire weekend we'll be talking all about these kinds of initiatives as well as how the zero waste movement um, intersects with the social justice movement and climate change. And so if you're interested in that, we would love to have you. We usually garner about 500 students and staff each year and representatives from other nonprofits. So um, definitely reach out, we'd love to have you register. Great. Um, thank you. Um, thanks a lot for that. A few thoughts. Um, let me just mute you for a minute. Yeah. So um, a, a, a few thoughts are um, so in the conference. So I really um, recommend if anyone's watching who's interested to um, go to the conference. I've heard really good things about the conference from Diana. Um, and um, also, um, when I was looking at the conference um, a little earlier, maybe last month, I saw that Kate Bailey was going to speak there. Um, I thought she was um, really awesome. I've read some of our articles, and um, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's really awesome to have you know good speakers. There. So I think it'll be really useful for everyone to be there. And um, another uh, point that I want to mention to Chris is, um, so we just had a, um, a call in the morning with uh, Olivia Lapierre and um, Chanel Crosby from B0. Uh, they're working on representation of uh, people of color in the environmental movements. Um, so you know, if you could uh, um, increase representation of um, such communities in, in the conference, you know, that'd be amazing. Uh, or you know, you could get in touch with them. Uh, I can provide you the details. And um, once once uh, this conference, uh, once the session is over, we'll also of course provide Chris details on, on our uh, website maybe um, after uh, next week. Um, and uh, we'll also put um, the details on uh, social media uh, if required, you know, to, so for, for anyone who would like to get in touch with them. Um, so um, just a few questions from based on the um, based on the presentation. Uh, one is, um, so how many campuses uh, do you have involved in plan right now? I mean, how many people from uh, how many campuses are working with you or engaging with you? And um, second, um, how many are implementing this model? How many are, you know, are trying to implement this model? You can unmute yourself, Chris. Great, that's a great question. Um, we work with uh, about 80 campuses currently. Um, we probably within the next month or two, we will ramp up to about 100 campuses nationwide with a few in Canada. And um, those are all over the country. Uh, we originally started on the East Coast, but have since expanded and have a lot of campuses throughout the West Coast and in, in the Midwest. And um, I would say that uh, the majority of campuses that we are working with um, are kind of like all over the board. So there are some campuses that are, you know, they've got an entire department committed to zero waste. Um, and they've kind of like really figured out how to how to communicate how things like waste and climate change intersects with environmental justice. And they're, they're doing like a really rigorous work around that. Um, whereas there's some campuses who have yet to get recycling on their campus. And so we're working with a wide variety of kinds of like what we're at and, and dealing with waste management and how it intersects with other issues. Um, and so to, to answer your second question, I would say um, maybe about half of our campuses are implementing some sort of plastic reduction campaign, whether that be uh, providing kind of like a positive reinforcement for, hey, bring your own mug to the cafe and we'll give you a 50 cents discount or something like that, um, all the way to a more rigorous system like a reusable to-go container program. Um, we've actually been able to create an entire guide on the to-go container program based off of some interviews with some of our member campuses who have successfully implemented this. Um, and that's a resource that's also that's also free, um, as well as the Plastic Free Manual in which this presentation is based. And so folks do not have to be part of a member campus to access those resources. And again, I'd be happy to provide those um, after the presentation for folks. Okay, all right, great, wonderful. Okay, all right. And, um, and, uh, uh, let me mute you again. All right, so um, uh, all right, so um, 
when it comes to um, creating change, you know, you, you always um, come across opposition. So, um, you know, in, in while, while trying to make campuses plastic free, what kind of opposition or where do you get it from mostly? Um, is it just inertia to change, you know, or is it more than that? Is, is it um, outright opposition to, you know, what you're doing? And um, if you do get such kind of opposition, how, how do you deal with it? You know, what kind of experiences do you have and what, what examples do you have? Unmute yourself. So um, there is kind of all ranges of opposition, some being as small as well. It's not as, um, it's not as sanitary to use reusable plastics. And my answer to that is, well, we've been using reusable forks and knives for for ages, and that seems to be serving us fine. Um, but I think that's that's part of that is um, part of a smaller discussion, which is an inertia to change overall. Um, one of those inertia to change factors, I think, can be a fear that uh, reusables are going to cost more um, because plastic is a really affordable, cheap product to, to be able to use. There's a reason why we use it at such a large scale. But um, there have been a lot of studies, and um, also within the manual that I mentioned, there are some resources as far as calculations on how to um, analyze kind of cost-benefit analysis of switching from um, disposables to compostables or reusables and the cost savings associated with that over time. It might not be an upfront cost savings, but over time, it usually is. Um, and they're also kind of like the secondary costs that are saving as far as uh, the impact on people and the environment. Um, and then I would say kind of the overall inertia to change um, would be that there are some, in some instances, there are just kind of like no, um, there are no infrastructure for the ability to like ban an item. So for example, in the state of Arizona, there is legislation that essentially bans bans. And so at the uh, Arizona State University, uh, they were able to kind of like get very sneaky with the language that they use to discourage single use uh, disposable plastics. So rather than banning them, they um, were saying things like, well, you know, if there is uh, um, food coming into our athletic venues, uh, none of those can be in single packaging, like single chip bags, like it must be rather than bulk and that we will serve those chips in sort of a compostable boat style um, container. And so there's ways and means to get around that. And so that really comes down to kind of knowing your local legislation um, as well as the sort of like policy of your campus and uh, working with folks, whether that be a champion on campus that's like a professor that you have very good rapport with um, or even folks in the community um, to be able to work with you to kind of figure out the, the loopholes that there are to, to jump through to to pass that. Great, wonderful. Um, and uh, one more question. Uh, we actually have a question for you um, online. Um, it's from Vivek Patel. He's a student at Auburn University. Um, and um, he says he's really impressed by the work of PLAN. And uh, what kind of support will PLAN provide if I start doing it on my campus? Does it need to be done through another campus or student organization or plan can have its student representative on campus? Yeah, so um, plan ourselves, we, none of us are students. Uh, we are all full-time staff members graduated. So um, we advise from afar and it is usually like a student like this student individual um, who expressed the question, who is particularly passionate on the campus and wants to start a program that will reach out to us. Um, and if they can get sort of like some support from their peers or kind of like a champion staff member, uh, we can get them signed up with a membership to access the resources so that any students on campus can access our online trainings, monthly calls with us for advising. So that essentially they are the representative for plan on the campus doing doing the work and implementing the change. We kind of advise, advise from afar and provide the best practice work. So I would encourage, I didn't catch the name, but uh, for this individual to, to reach out and I'd be happy to discuss more with them, kind of like how, like what they're interested in starting and how we will support them more tangibly. Great, wonderful. Um, and uh, one final question, um, we have only um, four minutes. So um, if you could respond to that and also, um, you know, give any concluding remarks, that would be great. 
And um, let me just um, remind everyone that um, uh, this is the uh, collective action theme on um, uh, on the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, and you were listening to um, Chris Kane from Plan. And um, friends, again, uh, the scale uh, the scale of the challenges that we face are planetary, and all of us have to take a step forward and do whatever we can on based on what, uh, irrespective of our situation in uh, personal professional lives or where we live or what we do. So um, uh, that's the only way in which we could um, uh, solve planetary challenges like this. And um, since 2013, BWASE West has been um, uh, disseminating knowledge on, on waste management. And if not for us, most of this uh, knowledge would have been uh, immobilized in lengthy PDFs or would have been uh, limited only to um, really expensive international conferences. So we're extremely happy about what we're doing here. And um, so the final question to um, Chris, um, I think what you said earlier kind of rest, um, answers this question which uh, um, that I have, which is, you know, if you're a student, you know, in which year do you start? Um, and how do you transition once you have to graduate? How do you transition the leadership from one to the other? But then I think what you said earlier probably answers that, answers that question. I'm not sure. So do you want to respond to this or and also conclude? Yeah. Um, so it's really we work with students to kind of start at any time, whether they are first in their first year of college and really excited, or they are in their last year and have a project that they really want to have implemented before they leave um, in their time there on their campus. But um, obviously we work with them to kind of say, okay, that's awesome. Let's leave your mark and, and create positive change before you leave, but we need to make sure that there's someone to kind of like adopt and, and take over this project after you leave. And so working alongside like a lower class, uh, like a, someone in um, like a freshman, sophomore uh, type of uh, year, um, and, and ensuring that leadership turnover takes place really smoothly, um, compiling sort of documents of all the project notes, all of your contacts, and being able to pass that items over. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about that like on our uh, online trainings that we run each month. But um, yes, I would say that really all it takes is kind of alluding back to what you said at the beginning around Chief is that um, it really kind of takes an individual passion and seeking out um, a little bit of support on campus, whether that be a staff member who maybe is already stretched thin, but they've got enough time to say like, you know what, yes, I will work with you periodically to look over your you know, business plan for this project on campus. And if you can find other students to be involved, if you can seek funding and seek support from groups like PLAN, then I will back that and kind of like be your champion on campus. Um, sometimes there isn't that staff member um, support that exists just because of bandwidth. And so there's a lot of power within students and what they can do on their campus um, and kind of making their time on their campus worth it while they're only there for maybe four or five short years. Um, and so that, that this is just a kind of long way of saying that really anyone can start at any time. And I think also something I want to close with too, and keeping in mind of uh, representation in this movement, um, is that I encourage that uh, for folks who see you know, being zero waste or the idea of zero waste inaccessible, there are many ways to do it and there are many steps to doing it. And I think there's a lot that we can learn uh, from existing practices of, um, you know, many people throughout the world and what their concept is of reducing waste and what their concept is of thriftiness or um, using materials to the most of their needs. And so I would encourage that to be a kind of a continual part of the conversation. Um, and, and also encourage that, you know, any, any knowledge is as power in that um, to contribute to the, to the um, innovative solutions to materials that are kind of, you know, less advantageous and, and don't make sense to the economy that we're in that. And so, um, yeah, I would just kind of, as in closing, encourage you all to, if you're interested in doing something like this on your campus, to reach out. Um, we'd love to see you at the conference. And um, I think this is really brilliant. Renji, thank you. Um, for inviting us to to present on the materials um, and be a part of this. This is awesome.